genetic mutation, that's a spontaneous change in the DNA, which is the program for every living thing, coupled with natural selection, the survival of the fittest. The extraordinary thing is that although the theory has been pretty well accepted universally for over a century now, there is absolutely no direct evidence to support it at all. Darwin made a big deal about the fact that there were various sizes of finches, small, large, medium-sized finches. He made a big deal of the fact that there were finches with uh, large beaks, thick beaks, long beaks, and thin beaks. Darwin assumed that these beaks were evidence of evolution. In fact, these beaks were the result of the genetic variability that already existed in the population. If you take two medium finches with medium-sized beaks, and you breed them, you will get some finches with small beaks and some finches with larger beaks. Over time, as these finches spread out into the various environments, certain beak sizes would be favored in certain environments and therefore they would become the predominant type. But the point is, is the capability to produce the small beaks, the medium beaks, and the large beaks was already in the parent population of the Galapagos finches. And it was simply the environmental differences that allowed them to be expressed. It was not the creation of any new and unique information. The trouble is that all these finches actually do interbreed. And that is the, in biology, this is the test of a, a species. Uh, two creatures which can breed and uh, produce live fertile young are regarded as being belonging to the same species and all of the Galapagos finches meet that criterion so there are not many many species. If evolution was true we wouldn't be concerned about the extinction of species there'd be new ones being created we don't have new species we got deterioration we have all kinds of species that no longer exist. Charles Darwin theorized that given enough time one kind of animal could evolve into another. This is the basis for the evolutionary tree of life taught in biology. Yet Darwin himself acknowledged the lack of transitional fossils in the rock strata. Darwin wrote, intermediate links, geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The key problem with Darwinism is finding hard physical evidence. Where would you look for that evidence? Well, obviously in the rocks, in the, the record of the rocks, the fossil record. Fossils have been collected for hundreds of years, for centuries. There are billions of fossils in every university and every museum in the world. But there are no intermediate species. You look at one strata and you find one kind of fossil. You look at the strata above it and you find a different kind of fossil. You don't find, what you don't find is a gradual change. One of the greatest evidences for creation is found in the fossil record. For example, in the so-called Cambrian rocks, we find a, uh, fossils of a vast array of very complex invertebrates, clams, snails, jellyfish, worms, brachiopods, trilobites, and many other very complex invertebrates. But nowhere on the face of this earth has anyone found fossilized ancestor to a single one of those complex invertebrates. Now that fact alone demolishes the theory of evolution. Evolutionists claim that these invertebrates in turn evolved into vertebrates, such as fish. However, over the last 150 years, scientists have unearthed billions of invertebrate and vertebrate fossils, and they have not found a single transitional form. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about appears fully formed, no trace of ancestors, and certainly no trace of transitional form linking these major kind of fishes to one another. Now that fact is known. Evolutionists know that. Now the fact that we have no ancestors for the fishes, the vertebrates, we have no ancestors for the invertebrates, means that we didn't have any ancestors. And evolution is impossible. A study of the geological record confirms that the major groups of animals each appear abruptly and fully formed. For example, within the insect world, there is enormous variety and complexity. Yet evolutionists offer no conclusive evidence that any of the insects evolved from a common ancestor. The same problem exists for all of the great variety of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. The evolutionary tree of life has no trunk nor branches. 
Therefore, all of the implied intermediates are only blind speculation. Sometimes um, Darwinists hold up examples of what they say are transitions. For example, I suppose the known example is Archaeopteryx, which appears to be half dinosaur, half bird. The trouble is, when you look at the dinosaurs that it might have evolved from, what you find is that none of those dinosaurs had a collarbone, and birds all do have a keeled breastbone which holds the pectoral muscles which enables it to flap its wings. It has been claimed in the past that Archaeopteryx was really nothing more than a feathered reptile. Well, I've never seen a reptile yet that you just stick a bunch of feathers in and kick it in the tail and it flies. And no, Archaeopteryx flew. He had wings and he certainly wasn't a feathered reptile. As a matter of fact, I have an article here before me published in March 1996 in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And the authors say this, the avian features of the skull demonstrate that Archaeopteryx is a bird rather than a feathered non-avian archosaur. The most important missing link of all, of course, is the missing link between an ape-like ancestor and mankind. That's the missing link that most of us are interested in. Have, have we found that? Well, if you listen to Darwinists, you'd think that we've found lots of them. In fact, the evidence really isn't there at all. All of the fossils that have been found so far have been classified, reclassified, either as human or as ape. And so far, the missing link is still missing. I have been investigating the so-called missing link between for many years and I have found that every single one of them um, simply is no link whatsoever. For example, Australopithecus, the uh, skeleton of Lucy, this really consists only of a 40% skeleton of a not very large ape and they have not got any evidence that it ever walked upright in any of the bones that they have found of that skeleton. The interesting thing about that is that Lucy is shown as being distinctly human-like. She's very erect in her posture. She's got human-like hands, human-like feet. Uh, I'm not quite sure where exactly the restorers got this data from because if you examine the paper by Randall and Sussman which described the type species to which Lucy belongs, they said quite clearly that she had long curved hands and feet, even longer and even more curved than a chimpanzee. Um, several distinguished anatomists have reached the conclusion that, for example, Australopithecus, the genus to which Lucy belongs, was simply an extinct ape, nothing at all to do with humans. If we analyze the so-called missing links, we find a trail of fraud, deception, and speculation. For example, Nebraska man was reconstructed, family and all, from an extinct pig's tooth. Piltdown Man is now universally known to be a deliberate hoax, consisting of an ape's jaw and a human skull doctored to look old. Neanderthals were just plain people, some of which suffered from arthritis, rickets, or syphilis. Ramapithecus, Gigantopithecus, and Zygantropus were just apes, while Heidelberg Man and Cro-Magnon were completely human. So, despite evolutionists' misleading claims, the missing link is still missing. One of the more amusing things you hear these days is that uh, the DNA of man and chimpanzees is 98.3% identical. And I have to admit, as a geneticist, I find that kind of humorous, that you're not even that closely related to yourself. And so the genes you inherit from your mother, the genes you inherit from your uh, father, uh, are on the average, at a maximum, only 93% similar. Scientists claim that the hemoglobin of a chimpanzee is 98% the same as the hemoglobin of a human being. What they don't tell you is there are many other organisms, including slime molds, that have hemoglobin, which is also very similar to the hemoglobin of a human being. Now you would expect a lot of similarities between man and chimpanzee. We breathe the same air, we have muscles and bones, we digest things similarly. If we were created by the same God, we would expect to have lots of similarities. But let's suppose for just a moment 
that the, there was some truth in that figure, although I haven't got a clue where in the world it could have come from. Uh, a cloud is 98% water. A jellyfish is 98% water. A watermelon is 98% water. To use evolutionary logic, there's no difference between a cloud, a jellyfish, and a watermelon. <laughs> Those 2% difference really make a whale of a difference uh, in man and chimpanzee. In the first chapter of Genesis, we are told that God created every living thing according to its own kind to reproduce and fill the earth. This is exactly